So welcome everyone to today's autonomy talk. Our speaker today is Rahul Mangaram. Uh, the title of the talk is Mad Games, Multi-Agent Dynamic Games with Autonomous Racing. We're very happy to have Rahul with us. Uh, a few words on Rahul. Rahul builds safe autonomous systems at the intersection of formal methods, machine learning and controls. He applies his work to safety critical autonomous vehicles, urban air mobility, life critical medical devices, and AI co-designers for complex systems. He currently is the pen director for the Department of Transportation's the 20 million safety, 21 national UTC, um, both of which focus on technologies for safe and efficient movement of people and goods. Rahul is the director of the AutoWare Center of Excellence for Autonomous Driving, a consortium of 70 plus companies and universities focused on open source AV software for open standards EV platforms. Rahul has received a large number of awards. Uh, notably in 2016, Rahul has received the US Presidential Early Career Award from President Obama for his work on life critical systems. And he also received in 2016, the Department of Energy's Clean Tech Prize. Um, and in 2014, the IEEE Benjamin Franklin Key Award. Um, we're very happy to have you with us, Rahul, and uh, very curious to hear uh, what you have to say us. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Emilio, for having me here. It's a great pleasure. Uh, so today I'm going to have, we're going to have a very fun talk uh, because we all like these kind of games, but now we're really interested in, you know, how can we have these games with full dynamics between multiple agents? And we're going to look at that in the context of autonomous racing, uh, because why not, right? We all love uh, F1 racing, so why not bring it to our research? Um, so uh, just uh, to give an overview, you know, my focus of my work has been on life critical systems. So that's at this intersection of formal methods, control, machine learning, and we apply it to different domains. Uh, obviously, today we'll talk about autonomous systems. But regardless of the domains, um, you know, like with medical devices, we look at implantable medical devices like cardiac defibrillators, pacemakers, um, and how they interact with the heart, how they should, you know, you should ensure that the software in these devices doesn't cause an adverse condition for humans, doesn't kill humans, like that, right? So the questions we always ask with all, anything that we do with our research is, how can we provide these guarantees for safety and performance in these closed loop life critical systems? And in autonomy specifically, you, you guys are very familiar with, you know, the, the closed loop aspects. There are multiple closed loops over here. And uh, so as part of this, you know, I, I direct the Safe Autonomous Systems Lab. And this is uh, one of the uh, umbrella organizations that we work with is the U.S. Department of Transportation. And I serve as a pen director for this transportation National University Transportation Center. So largest size uh, center that the DOT uh, uh, sponsors. And this is the fourth such center that we have been hosting here between Carnegie Mellon, where I came from, and Penn. Uh, and I'll talk later on you know, about our industry collaborations with AutoWare, our academic collaborations with AutoWare Center of Excellence. But briefly, AutoWare is the world's leading open source autonomous vehicle software stack. And this works on, you know, buses, uh, robo taxis, cargo, and uh, very exciting stuff. But we'll come back after we look at the research. Uh, and then also fun, right? It's fun stuff. We build these 110 scale autonomous racing cars uh, that's fully open source. And there's a community of over 80 universities that race uh, with this and do research with it. And so we'll we'll briefly touch on that too. So, but you know, you all know, like you know, as as you're trying to nudge this, if you see this vehicle here trying to merge into the traffic, this truck is not giving it a, a gap to get into. For you and me, yeah, you know, we we persist and then eventually we get ahead. It's not a big deal for us. But for autonomous uh, vehicles, we treat they still struggle with these non-cooperative scenarios. But the question is, you know, with the civilian driving on the roads, uh, you can define the goals to be like safety. Okay, you want to maximize safety, but then performance is very vague. Like, you know, if you reach five minutes late or six minutes late to say, oh, there was a lot of traffic or whatever, like weather was bad or 
there are so many reasons. So performance is not well defined. And as a research topic, you know, we really wanted to define like this tension uh, between safety and performance and where else to look at it, you know, on the extremes of these 300 plus kilometer per hour, you know, multi-million dollar racing machines like uh, Formula One, uh, where safety is obviously well-defined. If you're overly aggressive, you crash. And then, but performance is also very well-defined. If you're overly conservative, you're, you, you, you don't win. And that's a career choice. In fact, it's not a choice. You, you're racing to win. In fact, if you're even just half a second too slow in your lap time, you're out of the top 10. Like that, right. So, uh, so this is so performance is also well defined, and but it's not just about being fast. Like that, right. In fact, between 1950 to 2022, the race winner uh, only achieved the fastest lap time only 40 percent of the time, and uh, so it's not just about being fast. It's about having this consistency of finding the right balance between aggressiveness and restraint. Uh, at, at each corner, in each lap, in each maneuver, and being able to do that successfully. And that's crucial for success. And um, so, and of course, you know, when you are racing, if you're not driving at the limits of your handling, then also you're not going to win because the other competitors are right at that edge like that, right? So you're looking at this very non-linear operating points of where uh, for the tire model, for the entire vehicle stability, and you want to push it to the limit, not, not cross the limit, but you want to get as close to that limit. So you have high speeds, high accelerations, you know, very short reaction times, and you are working with the full vehicle dynamics over here. So that makes the problem even richer and more interesting. Obviously, crashing is expensive and dangerous. We all know that. We enjoy the crashes, but we don't want to be in one, obviously, right? The other issue is that when you are in this multi-agent setting, you know, you have your sensors, LIDARs, radars, uh, cameras, and their observations are telling you the vehicle's pose. You can have a short-term prediction of the uh, vehicle's uh, uh, path planning in front of you. But what we are interested in is, you know, what is the policy of the other agent? What is the intention in the driver's mind? We want to really get into the driver's mind to understand how are they going to take the next maneuver? And if I can estimate with high you know, accuracy and, and, uh, and low ambiguity, high confidence, what their uh, driving policy is, then I can come up with counter policies that can then outcompete them. And uh, in fact, you know, if you just look at your sensor observations, you know, even the uh, you know, actions of like identical sensor observations, the policies are strongly multimodal. So we have to go beyond just what our sensors are able to see uh, in front of us. And then finally, you might say, oh, why don't we just take the last you know, 20 races and then learn from how this particular driver drives on this. But the thing is that every race is different. The strategies are secret. The vehicle designs are, are not known ahead. The weather conditions are different. The driver's mindset is different. So it's a very small data regime. We can't just mine previous races and then try to you know, replicate that. So the reason we focus on racing is because we want to bring safety, but through agility. We want to bring the superhuman driving capability, uh, but by understanding you know, how we can operate you know, very well at these limits, how we can actually now keep uh, uh, balancing safety and, and, and assertiveness. So the first question is, you know, how can we generate the most competitive agents who can do this dynamic balance of safety and uh, assertiveness? And, and so this is going to just build on some of our work starting from, you know, this uh, paper that we had in ICML called Formula Zero. So you all know Formula One, that's like the set of rules that the vehicles need to have. But Formula Zero says, I'm getting into this race and I don't have an idea of how each particular competitor is going to race today. I have zero idea of them, but I'm still going to come up with, you know, a distributionally robust, you know, adaptation strategy on how they're going to behave. And we're going to do that by first having an offline stage where we generate a population. We synthesize a population of competent agents and, and then we'll see how it works online. Right. So we can start with, you know, the formulation as a standard robust reinforcement learning 
uh, ob objective here where we want to minimize an expected cost of a, over a set of actions over time. Uh, but since we don't know the behavior of other agents of the opponents, we have to have this as a minimax uh, problem here. And the overall idea is to learn a useful parameterization for this uh, set P over here of a set of uh, state action transitions. Uh, and because that represents the uncertainty of how the other agents are going to behave. And, uh, and so essentially offline through self-play, we are going to learn this set P, you know, and generate a population of good candidate racers, or you can think of them as prototype policies for good uh, racers. And then online, we're going to use robust uh, planning and uh, robust belief space planning against this opponent and identify what mix of these, you know, offline popular uh, strategies that we have generated is this agent and then start to minimize this, this uh, set P over here, minimize our uncertainty to then generate, you know, policies to outcompete them. So let's take a look at this, right? So you, you guys are familiar with these sampling based planners. We are generating a set of feasible trajectories. And then based on our estimate of how this opponent is going to behave, then we want to generate a minimum cost strategy, like uh, a, a trajectory over here. Uh, fine. But the question is, how do we want to think of these drivers, right? Do we just want to think of them as, you know, what's their steering angle and throttle position or something more abstract, something more descriptive about their driving behavior, about their driving policy, uh, as we can observe them. And we want to do this very efficiently, right? In just maybe 150 to 200 observations at 10 hertz, I want to start to identify, you know, what kind of driver this is. And uh, so what we do is, you know, offline, we basically run, you know, this, uh, uh, an optimization strategy where we have this self play to generate competitive agents. And we use a technique called parallel tempering, it goes back to the 1970s, which is like using a, Replica exchange, Markov chain, Monte Carlo sampling is essentially running multiple competitions offline. And then from these very hot bots to a cooler, cooler bots where you have more elite agents. And then you're doing, you're swapping the competitors across these bots to basically come out with what this beta one over here is a set of say 20, you know, elite agents. And by elite agents, we mean that, yeah, they are minimizing their lap time. Um, and they are also have a very high overtake rate against other, you know, self-play candidates. But they also are very diverse in the sense that they, for single laps, they don't just follow the same race line over here. They have a, a diverse set of race lines that still achieve the minimum lap time. And then when they're competing with opponents, then they don't just say, take the inside to do the overtake. They are, uh, they have different ways of whether overtaking or waiting and then deciding to overtake. And so essentially we describe these elite members of the population in their policy parameters. And uh, so we want to ensure that they are both competent in their, uh, uh, their, their, uh, their time, uh, lap time, and they are also diverse, right? And we can have different metrics for diversity in that sense. Uh, and so essentially offline, we have this, so we have now generated these policies and then now uh, online, we want to basically maintain a belief vector of the opponent's behavior patterns, you know, over these learned prototype behaviors, right? So, so if we have generated our set of goals, then we want to identify, you know, what is the, uh, with low ambiguity, you know, what is this, uh, uh, param how do we parameterize, you know, what is the expected trajectory of the opponent? And then based on that expected trajectory, we generate our minimum cost, right? So fair enough, that's quite straightforward, but let's look at this part. This part is really the, the part that is more interesting. Uh, so you can think of it like this, right? Suppose we start with a library of just three opponents, right? So we have opponent model one, two, and three, and uh, here we want to uh, now determine like, you know, with the opponent, we write this robust performance objective at time T as a receding horizon cost, right? So this cost uh, captures like, you know, how close the other agents are to one another, how much progress is made along the track. 
So say we expect that the opponent is going to take this trajectory over here. And with opponent model two, we expect the opponent is going to take this trajectory over here. And likewise with opponent model three, there is some other variation of the trajectory that they're going to take. And these are all the offline opponent models that we have here. And in reality, the opponent takes you know, some other trajectory and then we calculate the error and we want to minimize this worst case cost over here, right? So given our observations, we don't know which one, uh, which type of opponent we are playing against. And so our belief case, case state contains an estimate of the probability of each one. And so essentially we come up with a belief over here. And then we also have this uncertainty uh, uh, radius of this ball of uncertainty because we want to have a distributionally robust operating point. And our goal is obviously to shrink this ball down, right? So that uh, we can then have a lower ambiguity as to how the opponent is going to behave. So as we are doing these observations over here, you know, the opponent model keeps getting updated. And uh, as in terms of what kind of weighted mix it is of the prototype strategies. And in just a few iterations, we can identify this dominant mix of prototype policies that describe the opponent over here. And uh, we use the modified EXP3 belief vector to basically solve for these weights online very efficiently. Another way to think about it is that say in the beginning, we don't know what the opponent looks like. They have equal weights for all the candidate policy, prototype policies. And then over you know, a few observations, you start to see say, uh, you know, op opponent uh, prototype policy number uh, five starts to say have a higher weight compared to the other policies. And we can maintain this as we are racing against the opponent. So let's look at you know the first mini hypothesis, right? First, we want to talk about safety, right? And we want to maintain like this robustness in terms of you know the size of the robustness ball uh, around the opponent's policy. And so, if I increase the size of the ball, I have increased robustness. And does that translate to increased safety? And we see that you know when we look at the time to collision values that are less than five percent, the percentage of that time that falls, that goes from say something like 7.86% to 5%. So we see that, you know, the larger the robustness ball, the less frequently the agent gets into these near collisions like that, right? So our low time to collision events. And so, yeah, increasing robustness, improved safety, fair enough. Not, not surprising, it's, it's just validating our mini hypothesis. But the consequences is that as we become, you know, have a, a larger robustness ball over here and increase our safety and become more conservative, we pay the price by reducing our win rate from about 60% to 50%. And that is not what we want. And so our main hypothesis was, you know, can we regain this, uh, our, uh, you know, our, our, our advantage over here uh, through adaptivity, right? So, so can we initially, when we start the race, we don't know much about the opponent. And uh, so we have a large, high, large uh, robustness uh, ball. And then as we start to learn about the opponent, then we have identified what their strategy seems to be like. And we can see that with online adaptivity, we maintain this 60%, you know, uh, win rate and so online adaptivity preserves the win rate even you know when uh, while maintaining a high robustness value and uh, so that's sort of showing that you know we can capture that right so and then if we see over here uh, uh, we do the theory and then we also execute this and so this this card is our our ego vehicle it's doing the observations and then overtaking the other vehicle to show that it works right so the car behind us is our is, is our ego vehicle and now it's doing the observations. Obviously it has a small field of view. So it has to, so in simulation, we would have a, a you know, maybe about 150 to 200 observations, but in, in when we run it for real, uh, it takes about 400 to 600 observations because of the limited field of view, but it runs on a Jetson and this whole thing runs in real time with that, right? So, so we could see that, you know, that, this this uh this distributionally robust online adaptation you know first we synthesize a diverse population of high performing policies and then we can then use these policies you know for uh, you know efficient robust online planning and adaptation and uh, so 
the 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 problem with this approach so far you know that that we have seen is that uh it it what if your uh, opponent is not among your candidate policies right what if they are out of distribution then you become very conservative right and you don't win against them and so there was this out of distribution problem the computational complexity was quite high because you got to calculate this for each opponent and uh, so then we said, okay, why don't we come up with a more efficient framework for this game theoretic uh, uh, planning? And uh, so we started to look at it with a different kind of, you know, mindset. And uh, so very briefly, you know, we think of this as first, we think of this as an extensive game. We are not just, you know, racing and we just want to overtake right at the next turn. It's that we start off this race, say the ego over here is the orange agent and then the green is the opponent. First, we have imperfect knowledge. We don't know anything about the player, uh, the opponent, and but we have perfect recall. That means as we are racing with them initially, we are observing them and we are recording their every move and including how we can interact with them and do this kind of online system identification. And then, then at this decision point, we change our strategy. That means we started off with an initial strategy and we say, okay, now we need to come up with a different strategy. And the whole point over here is to say, okay, we have a pretty complex game because it's full dynamics, it's continuous time planning, and uh, we need to identify where the opponent is, but in a reduced dimensionality of the problem space. And so we just reduce this problem to two axes of restraint and aggressiveness. I will, of course, explain how we come to this simplified form over here, uh, but then our main goal is to say, okay, this is where the opponent is operating at in this very reduced dimensional uh, 2D operating space. And we started off at this point and we want to get say more aggressive. And then we start to become more aggressive. That means we switch our strategy. And, and then we start to say overtake. Maybe we don't overtake right away, but then we come up to a next decision point, next decision point. And we are continuously switching our strategy based on what we just learned about the other agent, and then we are, uh, are, are are competing. So the question is, okay, you know, how do we actually, now we're thinking more strategically, right? And I'll tell you what a strategy is, like what's the difference between a policy and a strategy, but, but essentially we are trying to decide how do I change my, you know, my operating behavior based on that? And how do I decide which strategy to get to, right? So, and that's the goal of this, this paper here. Essentially, we are treating this as a zero-sum extensive game with imperfect information, perfect recall. And the main reason for this is that, you know, yeah, you guys are work a lot in planning, right? So you know that this planning space is infinitely large because it's a continuous problem. And so both the state space is, is very large, but also the game tree of you know, coming up with these different strategies in an extensive game is also intractable. Like that right because the game tree has uh, it can has so many branches so and and very large depth so so say if you have like a uh, you want to parameterize this agent now then you have a sampling based planner over here you have these costs you want to encourage high speeds you want to have minimum deviation from the race line you you want to penalize high occurrence of you know high speed and high curvature and then you want to maintain smoothness or continuity on the previously selected trajectory. Obviously, you don't want to collide with the opponent or the track boundaries. So all these costs are captured as a set of weights over here. And essentially, we want to now learn from many races. And, as a, and because we want to sort of take this very high dimensional problem and map it into something that is that we can just purely think strategically. We don't want to think in terms of oh, what specific trajectory should I now generate from a planning perspective? We want to take the planning problem and move it to a strategic problem of how do I change my policy in response to what I've observed with the agent, right? So, so we want to map this into a reduced dimensional space of just you know conservativeness and aggressiveness. More aggressive you get towards the left, more conservative you get over here. And we want to come up with these policies. And the way we do that is, Similar to the previous work, we use like gradient-free optimization and run multiple self-play games and come up with a Pareto front of optimal policies and plot them, you know, along on on and map them 
onto this this uh these two axes over here and and now the question is now i have this set of elite policies but the question is if i start randomly with one how do i select which one do i transition to and we map that as a game using counterfactual regret mi minimization or cfr but to execute the cfr online is very complex and 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 it's not it's very compute intensive. So what we do is we run a, about a million games offline and we learn the CFR regret prediction model. And then we just have a very small neural network that just replaces the actual strategy to select which strategy I should sort of switch to. And uh, so, so essentially now we, we, we have to now decide, okay, as we st and we want to run this. So now as we start our race, we observe, observe, observe the other agent, and then we come to a decision point. And after that decision point, we switch our strategy, and then we become, say, more aggressive. We all, obviously, if you become more aggressive, you are more likely to win, but what if the opponent starts off very aggressive, then, and you also become very aggressive, then you'll crash. So sometimes I'll show you examples when the opponent starts off very aggressive, we back off. And then we decide when to become more aggressive. So it's not all about becoming more aggressive. That would be a trivial, greedy approach to doing that. So, so let's say in this example that I've showed you so far, the opponent starts off here. That means they are moderately aggressive and, and, and somewhat conservative. And we start off here slightly more aggressive. And then we, we decide to transition to being more aggressive, right? So trivial case, but it's just proving the point. So what we can show is that, you know, being game theoretic, first of all, you know, it improves the uh, the win rate significantly, right? So uh, if it's non from non-game theoretic to game theoretic, our win rate, you know, goes up by uh, at least 5% over here. And then it also generalizes very well for unseen opponents and for unseen maps. And that is very important for us because we want to come up with this approach that then can work with, say, any F1 track and any type of opponent in, in that case like that, right? So, uh, so here are some examples that if the opponent started over here and we started at this, then we start to become more and more aggressive. And then finally, after, you know, one, two, three, four uh, changes in our strategy, we win. Uh, and, and, and then if the opponent started here, and same similar, right? Sometimes the opponent starts here and we become less aggressive, more, uh, have more uh, less aggressive is towards the left over here, and then and then later on we decide to become more aggressive like that, right? So so not always because the opponent started off being very very aggressive like that, right? So uh, so we have to then uh, automatically, but this these transitions are all run by the game by this uh, counterfactual minim uh, regret minimization uh, and by the learned uh, game outcome. So here you can see that we reach this decision point and then we decide to switch our strategy and then we uh, come up with that overtake here, right? So this is just illustrating the same example again. And as the game goes on, but it's an extensive game. So we are playing it for the long run. Uh, this is These are some of the folks that were in my team in the past year. We have Johannes Betts. He's actually just uh, wrapped up last year and he's a uh, assistant professor in TU Munich. Uh, and then, so people working on learning-based control, uh, on physics-informed uh, uh, planning, more on formal uh, guarantees for machine learning, and uh, and many other folks uh, working on. And so this work that I presented was largely with uh, uh, Billy Zeng on balancing safety and performance. And uh, so it's a very happy team. This is uh, one of our, uh, our recent parties that we had and people from many different countries. We really like to have a lot of the diversity here. Uh, some of the other work that we work on is on looking at uh, localization. Typically you would use like particle filters or iterative algorithms. And so, but localization is, you know, is an inverse problem, right? That means you, you get LIDAR scans, you want to estimate the pose or you have the pose, you want to recreate the map. And so one way of the inverse problem is always much harder and it's ambiguous. So we map this into like an invertible neural network where you can have the pose from this side and the LIDAR scans from this side and you balance the dimensionality and using normalizing flows, you can actually now run 
this localization at over 270 hertz uh, with actually a lot of compute to spare on a, on a Jetson, for example. And uh, so this is showing how we can localize an actual F 110th car in our corridors, uh, how it actually can recreate these, you know, city scale maps and, uh, and provide like less than point, uh, to uh, 0.3 uh, meter accuracy. So very close to the state of the art, but all running uh, with implicit uh, map uh, compression and uh, pose estimation in the neural network. This also works very efficiently with images. That means you just capture a set of images now and uh, you can then estimate the pose. And, uh, and this runs at over 150 Hertz uh, on the Jetson again. And uh, so this is uh, just driving through our corridors over here. And none of these images are actually real images. These are all generated now as part of the invertible neural networks uh, uh, um, uh, map reconstruction. Uh, and uh, so, and, and then this basically shows that, you know, first of all, you know, this it's uh, the rendering cost is very cheap over here and the generation mode is totally offline. So compared to a lot of these nerve based approaches, um, it's uh, actually very uh, very efficient to use, and it works on uh, on all of these edge hardware devices. The other important aspect is that this kind of localization approach uh, exposes the uncertainty. So you can use an EKF and get then even more precise localization for actual experiments over here of like you know 0 0.02 uh, meter accuracy and and including uh, higher accuracy than. Uh, particle filters for uh, rotational uh, poles, yeah. Other sort of work is on, you know, how do we race on multi-friction surfaces? And so how do you adapt your controller uh, dynamically as the friction is changing? So say you have friction one, friction two, then one approach we use like an ensemble of Gaussian processes uh, to achieve that. And essentially this automatically then captures, uh, tunes the uh, MPC to adapt to the changing frictions over here. And this was presented earlier this year at uh, IFAC. And, uh, uh, and and this shows that, you know, as you're going from, you know, high friction to low friction to medium to the, 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 the vehicle is still very smooth and it is, it is adapting, you know, uh, very well with very low error, uh, just using this ensemble of GPs and dynamically changing the weights uh, for uh, the model uh, for, for MPC uh, as, as it progresses through this, right? So it's a very uh, efficient approach to doing that. So now that's just giving some snapshots. There's a lot more research work, uh, you know, that, that goes on with, you know, uh, safety, with uh, control barrier functions, learning-based control barrier functions uh, and, uh, uh, and and uh, other work more on formal safety guarantees, but I'll talk a little bit about the general sort of things that we do beyond our research. So one is that you know we've developed this uh, and hosted this community called the F one tenth Autonomous Racing Community, where we actually develop the you know open source uh, vehicle designs, host competitions, and also have open source courses that are taught in dozens of universities now. And the main motivation for this was, you know, like say this is my research and it works in this sort of, you know, intersection, but it's not sufficient to make like a full, you know, autonomous uh, system. Now this is going beyond just autonomous vehicles. Um, you need to have all these other aspects that you guys are very familiar with. And then, but students, when they go through their education, they just learn each topic, you know, in silos. And you like learn CV, but it has nothing to do with planning or dynamics. Uh, or you learn signal processing, but it has nothing to do with, like, say, uh, GPUs or, or power systems like that, right? So, um, like, uh, you want a high accuracy with your perception system, but does it run in real time? Oh, that's not a, that's not a big concern for many, uh, you know, uh, algorithms as you learn. So we built this uh, system, which is all off the shelf. So nothing like your rocket science over here, but it's 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 complex enough that you can do you know perception, planning, control, all you know in one place like that, right? And and we are not talking about like you know toy problems over here. We want to make it very much like a research uh, system, 
and it runs a GPU on board, it runs uh, LIDARs, depth cameras. But the important thing is that this design is all open source with that, right? And, and we call it one-tenth the scale, but it's 10x the fun because now you as students can use this vehicle, you can drive it, you can crash it, you can basically implement all the algorithms. The platform is done. Now focus on the algorithms. And so there is also like different simulators that are part of F110. And these are all maintained by the community. And the code is clean. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's runs an open AI gym interfaces for running RL based algorithms. Uh, and hundreds of people have used this code. So there's not like any issues, like major issues with, you know, any bugs uh, that we know of with that, right? So there are 3D simulators, 2D simulators. And our goal is, uh, you know, to build, help the community build code and race and, uh, uh, but we want to go from simple algorithms. We don't want to just do this gap kind of finding algorithms that you do in like high school or in undergraduate. We want to run SLAM. SLAM runs on all these vehicles for the past many years. It's uh, It runs uh, effortlessly. Uh, we want to go obviously to RRT because we are, we are talking to Emilio here and, and all these other sampling based planners that are many different controllers, planners to choose from, they all run out of the box uh, in the system. We obviously want to go from PID to MPC, different MPCs, MPC, MPPI, different algorithms all run uh, on this uh, approach, right? In fact, this video is back from 2019 when we had a competition. On, uh, this is actually the competition trail uh, in, in uh, Montreal. And, uh, <clears throat> And so we designed a course also, uh, like, like you'll have many courses on autonomous uh, vehicles, but here this course is, uh, is fully open source. So this is just a snapshot from spring 22. It's being taught you know, in many, many universities now, uh, uh, in, including like just last, this semester, CMU started teaching it, TU uh, Vienna started teaching it, TU Munich, uh, University of Virginia and so on, right? So. So the first uh, set is like for the the best part of this course is that there are no uh, no exams, no midterms, no finals, but just races, right? So after six weeks, you have race one. They learn ROS. They basically learn reactive methods, and then they have to start to race and put it all together. And uh, and then after that, they learn about localization, mapping, SLAM, pure pursuit, and then putting it all together with their own maps. And then they have race two. They see the car is obviously running much faster, much more confident. And then they get into the third, the, the next module where we look at the ethics in decision making with planning, race line optimization, sampling based planners, model predictive control, and then more learning based approaches for vision, RL, and how you can actually run that in simulation and then on the vehicle. We have all these different imitation learning algorithms like, you know, uh, Dagger, AC Dagger, EIL, uh, all running on the platform. And, and then you come to race three, where the students actually bring in their own innovation in those races. There are over eight labs all the way, uh, and they're pretty hands-on, but they are also focused on algorithms like that, right? So uh, then students in the last month, they do projects on their choice, right? So usually these students are in teams of uh, three students and they pick their projects. These are just a sampling of some of the projects we had in the past few years. And uh, and again, this is mostly like, you know, senior undergraduates and master's students that, that do this course. And over the years, all the way back from 2017, like this guy is now head of Tesla's motion planning, NVIDIA autonomy, Honda autonomy, and so on. And obviously it goes on till 2023. And the question is like, you know, how do you get involved? And it's very easy to get involved in that. Just go to f110.org and it'll help you. There are IKEA-like uh, instructions on how to build the vehicle, then how to code it. There are all the lectures. Everything is recorded in videos. And then races, there are lots of races, right? I mean, we've had 15 international races so far. And uh, and uh, just in, uh, you can see this was in Ikra 22. They were, you can, they're very happy, right? I think... Um, and they all come up with their own vehicles designed from the instructions and then they race it. So you can't have like a vehicle that are, you've spent more money on or faster motors. And, and really this is an example. Of and the um, Zurich team is still struggling with the pressure made up by... Yeah. Yeah.
Pues that was my super excited uh, postdoc Johannes. Uh, it was a great uh, cough, very fun competition. Uh, and uh, so here you can see the some of the teams that participated. All the teams build a map. They come up with their race line, and then they come up with their overtaking strategies. Um, and then the, the the basically the layout is then fixed for two days. This was in Ikra in London this year. Uh, again, very happy teams over here from ETH, from uh, Technion, UT Austin, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, so so this was. Uh, Oh. This was in IROS. So I'll just play that again since it's very smooth maneuvers here. Yeah, so that that was just in IROS uh, recently, like that, right? And then I, I shared this video. I'll just play it for a minute. This is just showing how Fox Cloud is integrated. Yeah, and then you know, uh, then then students have started making their own videos. This this student here, a few months ago, he had over more than half a million views on how he started racing with F one ten, and I think his other video has like over uh, now over four hundred k views. Uh, I mean, this Gen Z knows how to make videos. Not not me, but <laughs> but I'll I'll leave it to them, right? So in the coming year, we will be racing in five different competitions. Uh, obviously. Uh, ICRA, IROS, Cyber Physical Systems Week, IEEE. So that's in the robotics community, the CPS community, and the transportation community. That's intelligent vehicles and ITSC, intelligent uh, uh, transportation systems. Uh, and uh, we have had workshops over here, uh, you know, with over 200 participants in this ICRA workshop. It was such a hit. And you know, people just showing things that were just crazy, right? I mean, and but but controlled drifting and Peter Werman was showing his nature paper on you know superhuman uh, racing and so on. And then we had this workshop just in uh, in Iros on mad games, and again it was really very well attended. And uh, that's that's where I, you know I met Jody there. And uh, so now this community has grown to over 80, 80 uh, different universities. They do research, they teach, uh, and then they compete uh, with this, right? So one last hat for the last five minutes I'll just present is how we relate to industry. So I serve on the board of AutoWare and AutoWare is, a, uh, as I mentioned before, is the world's leading open source autonomous uh, driving software uh, stack. And uh, so as part of AutoWare, I also direct the AutoWare Sensor of Excellence. And basically, AutoWare runs on all these, right? In Indie Autonomous Challenge, AutoWare runs on that. Robo taxis in, in Tokyo, buses in, 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 in Turkey and in Michigan, and then, you know, uh, in intra logistics uh, systems all over uh, Japan and Estonia and Poland and so on, right? So there are over actually 80 different companies now. Uh, and, and partners as part of AutoWare, including ARM, uh, AD-Link, uh, NXP, and uh, a large uh, companies to, to medium to small companies, but they are all focused on the open source aspect and they contribute to that. Uh, and uh, so as part of the centers of excellence, you know, we have many different faculty, over 25 faculty that are there from all over the world, uh, including, you know, Turkey and uh, uh, Poland. And so, for example, Zednik Hanzelek uh, from Czech Technical University, he uh, headed the, he started the model based software uh, design group in Porsche, and that grew to 350 people. And I mean, he's faculty here and very involved, and uh, um, including Taiwan and so on, right? So, many different uh, universities have are part of this. And this is a really good community. To, uh, and we have uh, ETH. Uh, Michelle, my, my, Michael over here is a part of uh, that, uh, uh, the 
We also have a lab and for, this is a different lab from my research lab. So this is a second lab just for auto wear where we can drive in our vehicles. And mostly we're focused on the skateboard like electric vehicle platforms. And, uh, and essentially we drive them in and out and then we focus on building the AV plug-in play, you know, uh, autonomous driving kit for all of these systems. So we have auto wear running on 110 scale we have these uh, autonomous go-karts. I mean, not as good as the ones you guys have, but it's coming up, but it's also open source. The whole design is open source. And then we also have these kind of uh, logistics vehicles uh, that are all cloud-based configurations for different use cases. So for example, one of the student projects uh, last semester was on building an autonomous go-kart from scratch. And uh, so drive by wire, steal by wire, throttle by wire system. And, uh, but uh, this is again, you know, this is not uh, 30 students. This is just, you know, six, seven students all doing this in part time. Uh, and they got it to work in under four months. Uh, but the entire design is open source, right? I think that's the important aspect. It's not just that we we want to keep it for ourselves. Everything is fully documented. And, and then each person is like, responsible for different parts of the project and, uh, and they got it to work uh, and uh, and and they won the aut autonomous uh, karting competition in uh, in May of 23 uh, as part of that demo uh, so there's a lot more of activity but I'll pause here and you know just to say that you know we're obviously always open for research collaboration especially in this area of multi agent play strategies with improvisation or imitation learning with multiple you know imperfect uh, experts, uh, explainability in modular autonomous systems and, and so on, right? So a lot of the other work is on, you know, software defined vehicles, uh, much more applied, but I think these these are going from algorithms to applied. And uh, so I'll, I'll stop here and take any, happy to be take any questions. All right, thank you, Rahul, for the great talk. Um, We'll yeah open the stage. So if you want to have any qu questions, please unmute yourself or write into the chat. I saw that there were a few questions uh, in the chat during the course of the talk. Um, so maybe um, I start with these, and then we um, we have the people ask questions just by muting themselves. Um, the first question uh, that came in was. I think when you go back, Rahul, to your slide 20 or and, and below, like it was on, on just before slide 20 something, yeah. um, when the first part of the talk, um, which was before, exactly, I think it was there, um, was the question was, how are by Ivan uh, Ruhkin, who was asking, how are these agents precisely trading off safety and performance? Is it a single objective function? Um, if you want to elaborate on that, it was before the game theoretic approach. So it was yeah. still in the right distributionally robust, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think over here, uh, we we have the the we have these two uh, you know objectives, right? That means we want to make progress. And uh, I think I had it here. Yeah. So so the cost basically here captures, you know, how close we are getting to one another. And so that's the safety. You can just treat it as a time to collision. And then the other cost is basically how much, you know, how much progress we are making around the track. And we basically want to weigh, weigh them. And, and essentially the opponent model here is choosing a different kind of weighting for each one like that, right? So, so the, it's not like we have a fixed set of weights or, or a, it's just that each opponent model has uh, dynamically is choosing a different kind of weighting uh, for that. So we have these competing objectives and, and the whole theme of this is really how do we balance the safety and the performance. And uh, so at, sometimes the, the weight is to be more safe and sometimes we don't, we don't attempt an overtake. We will might just follow the other agent. And then when the opportune moment comes based on the policy, the weight for you know, making progress will will start to increase. Like right, thank you. I think that answers the question. If it doesn't, uh, Ivan, feel free to uh, follow up. Yeah, I know Ivan very right, well. Right, right. 
Excellent. Um, then there were two questions that related uh, to the webinar, um, to the autonomy talk, uh, how they can be accessed. So this will be recorded indeed, and then published online on the YouTube channel of the uh, autonomy talks once it's edited. So you can go there um, or Google autonomy talks ETH that should lead you to the page. And then you can find your way there to a list of all the talks that we had. I think there is one last question from the audience that is here in the chat is, uh, do you guys work with donkey car? Uh, and I'm not familiar with the uh, donkey car, um, but if if uh, the uh, author of the question wants to elaborate more, otherwise I'll leave it uh, here for you, Rahul. Do you know about donkey car? Are you working with it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I know uh, Donkey Card. It's a very good project. Uh, and uh, I, I think the the objectives are somewhat similar with Donkey Card, uh, but uh, F110 is, uh, you know, has, has its, you know, it, its focus is on perception planning control for Ackerman steering, using LIDARs uh, and cameras with sensor fusion uh, versus the Donkey Card is a much more simplified platform which is just uh, mostly skid steer uh, i guess uh, and camera based uh, but at a smaller like city kind of scale and so the donkey cars objectives are you know uh, on the education wise are very well defined it's a very respectable and good project uh, but i think in our case we are focusing on uh, racing at a higher speeds uh, using the full perception planning control pipelines so I would think of them as complementary. Donkey card is really good for, you know, training uh, like uh, K through 12 uh, students. And then F110 is for, you know, more advanced, uh, advanced in quotes algorithms for uh, training, uh, you know, uh, university level students. All right, thank you. Uh, Rahul, if I may. Um... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, definitely, you know, thank you very much for this very, very exciting work. You know, I remember seeing the platform when I visited uh, your lab uh, some time ago, right? But um, yeah, yeah, uh, it was very nice. Um, now, something I was thinking of is, you know, clearly not something that you have addressed, right? But, um, you know, nowadays, I don't know if you follow Formula One or any of these. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Sports. And... What you have now is things like DRS, right? So something that is meant to simplify passing or to allow more passing or you know, things like that. Is that um, and also, but even given the DRS, what you see very often that uh, races are won or lost in the pit stop, in the pit stop strategy, right? M many of my students have told me that. <laughs> <laughs> So, Especially in the last year. <laughs> right, 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 right. So would it be interesting to apply? I mean, this is more clearly like high-level strategy, right? But um, yeah. you know, I, yeah, I, I think it would be something uh, I would be interested in seeing it. Is uh, you know, how would you strategize your pit stops, right? And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I uh, think you know what what we can do, Emilio, is that. You know, we since we will be having these races in 2024, uh, you know, maybe in one of the races we can do it uh, together as a collaboration with ETH mm -hmm. and say, uh, because like we had with Daniela, you know, we have yeah, been yeah, yeah, yeah. with, so we have like different themes for the races. So, yeah. uh, la, uh, in May, the the video I was showing you with the Fox Club, that theme was multi friction racing. So they put like these um, plastic sheets. 3M plastic sheets so the cars would skid and they would uh, because that I, I did that with Joy the Biswas from UT Austin and so I said you know each each uh, collaborator for the race they bring in their uh, so, their special so special, special yeah. thing so it's Joy the because we we collaborate with him on this multi friction racing so he says why don't we introduce that so fine then yeah. Daniela was like why don't we put in motion capture and try you know two on two racing. I said, okay, we can do that. So I think with you, maybe we can say, uh, you know, let's let's look at a, a, a like a long term race that you you want to race fifty laps, and then you need to have like a a, a pit stop changeover, and you know, and 
so we could have some elements like that right yeah, because yeah. at the at the end of the day we want to bring this back to algorithms for this uh, for the learning uh, side so i think if we can construct that theme as to like you know what is a, a kind of like a lifelong st uh, strategy uh, to come up with and more of an endurance also a strategy like that right yeah. so like uh, in in the uh, in in these twenty four hour races, you have uh, you have to think very differently in terms of how you manage your fuel and your energy and your heat, and and then your tires. Unfortunately, our races are too short. Like you know, they are just you know five minute races because we need to go through like twenty thirty teams. Yeah, yeah, and probably you cannot do the pit stop right things like that. But, uh... Yeah, yeah, but I but I think the point is we don't want to keep the race fixed. You know, like the it every yeah. time it can have a theme. And uh, so I think we can bring in some of that, right? I mean, one of the themes we will try to introduce in 24 is two on two racing then. How can you come up with like, uh, so that's also like a research theme. How can you come up with collaborative strategies in competitions? And then how can you improvise with that, right? So like some of the research we are working on now is how can you come up with languages to describe teaming and uh, and roles and interactions uh, and then this also brings in like you know uh, how do you do online system identification as you're interacting like say if I'm, I'm driving racing against you I want to interact and I want to learn say a 80 percent accurate model but I don't want to reveal more than a 60 percent accurate model to to you so, so I think we can get some inspiration from these themes uh, without getting too fancy for the race because I think, to be honest, at the end of the day, the race is 90% brute force that you're fast enough and you can just not crash. Mm -hmm. And then less than 10% is strategy. But but I don't tell that to all the students. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, they, I'm just saying strategy is obviously exciting and fancy, but you need to be competent enough to, to, to get there. Okay, Rahul, thanks a lot. Um, sorry, I would love to keep chatting but uh, i had to jump on another meeting but yeah, um sure. thank you again uh, thank you very much yeah. thank you mark bye right all right then i uh, yes bye emilio i'd um, ask also for a final question from the audience and um please if you have any feel free to add it to the chat or unmute yourself right people saying thank oh i see Please go ahead, Ivan. Uh, hi, Rahul. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask about, in the context of this prediction of what other agents are doing, do you think there is a really big difference in predicting what a human racer would do versus, you know, a neural network racer or classic optimization racer? Yeah, I think, you know, some of the recent work we are focusing on is, you know, how can you do imitation learning? That's just trying to identify, you know, the how the human works. So I think, uh, but, you know, you I'll talk about that and I'll explain the difference. So, so we usually with imitation learning, you have like a single, you know, a teacher and, and you, and they are an expert. And in this case, what we have is basically, you know, even how we learn in life, we don't learn from a single expert but we learn from multiple experts and they are not, they're only good in one thing or two things, but they're not good in everything like that, right? So, uh, so we want, so we frame this problem as how can we learn from multiple imperfect experts like that, right? So you have, uh, so some experts crash in this place and take different turns more efficiently. So how do I keep, how our goal is to be better than the best from all these human uh, experts or these, these different rollouts. And uh, so at each mm -hmm. point, we need to decide which experts should I follow and how do we de-conflict that? And, uh, and how do we take care of experts that are crashing? So we don't want to throw away that data. But to go to answer your question, I think with the human, their strategy is very adaptive like that, right? And, and, and I think with the neural network, you might you know adapt in sort of uh, you could think of it as if you think of it neurosymbolically you could just be switching between few modes of of driving so i think with a human racer there is also like uh, the difference that we have uh, right now is that the human racer has this adaptive risk say in the 
in lap five out of 50 laps, they're not going to go to the maximum risk. But if it's just your last lap, then you're just like, look, I'm going to race or it's bust, you know, go bold or go home. And uh, so my risk level is at the next, you know, I, I will dynamically change my risk level. So I think we want to learn from those aspects. Those are more like longer time scale aspects. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right, All right, I think thank right, you very that, much. it's time to finally thank Rahul one more time. And uh, thanks for the great talk. And uh, see everyone for the next week's autonomy talk again. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.